Hello and welcome to Denver 7 Goes 360. I'm Ann Trujillo. And I'm Shannon Ogden. 360 is our commitment to you to look at issues from every angle so that you can make an informed opinion on topics that impact us all. For the next 30 minutes, we're focusing on topics that impact your children, starting with what is always a starting pistol for a heated debate, vaccinations. And that is a topic that generated thousands of comments on our Facebook page in just a few hours. Here's Denver 7's Russell Haythorne. The great debate over vaccinations has taken many twists and turns in recent years. The risks to not vaccinating are real. You know, it's a damn shame. Let's start with the debate in pop culture. In 2008, actress and activist Jenny McCarthy appeared on Larry King Live and told the nation that vaccines can trigger autism. It's an infection and or toxins and or funguses on top of vaccines that push children into this neurological downside. That set off a firestorm of controversy. All the research, research that was saying there's any kind of a link has been so incredibly debunked. So let's take the current debate 360. Those who argue that vaccines are safe say they are the single greatest health development of the 20th century. Once you introduce a vaccine against a particular disease, the incidence of that disease decreases really dramatically. The CDC recommends kids get 29 doses of nine different vaccines from ages zero to six years old. I'm very careful about keeping my kids up to date. While no federal laws mandate vaccinations, all 50 states require them for children entering public schools. But most states, including Colorado, offer medical and religious exemptions. That's what anti-vaccination mom Nicole, not her real name, is doing to get around state mandates. I feel like vaccines aren't really a one-size-fits-all. She and other opponents argue children's immune systems can deal with nearly all infections naturally. They've never had ear infections. They've never like, had strep throat or anything like that. For Nicole, it's not about autism. Rather, she stands firmly against the ingredients in vaccines, metals, animal parts, and some aborted fetal tissues. I'm a Christian and I'm against abortion. I know my family judges me for it, but... In my heart, I just don't feel like it's right. Pediatrician and leading vaccine researcher at the University of Colorado Hospital, Dr. Amanda Dempsey, says the amount of metals and other ingredients in vaccines are minimal compared to what we pick up in our natural environment, and they are in no way detrimental to children's health. All of these concerns are based on information that's really been twisted and, and blown out of proportion relative to the benefits of vaccination. There's a lot of fear mongering. Mother of two, Emily Adams, started questioning vaccines when her daughter began attending a school with only a 50% vaccination rate. It's very emotional to parent, um, and I think it's really easy to get scared. She changed her mind because she says a lot of what was being pushed was propaganda and lies. Mom groups on Facebook, and I would look and it's like, yeah, they have some information here, but they're also trying to sell me a bunch of stuff. We're seeing a lot more activity on Twitter with regards to anti-vaccination content. Matthew Kaskovich is a lecturer and communications expert at CU Denver and points to a recent CU Boulder study that shows a proliferation of debunked information on Twitter. It examined 500,000 tweets between 2009 and 2015 with the words autism and vaccine. It concluded the vast majority of those tweets are anti-vaccine. And the vocal minority continues to push information linking developmental disabilities to vaccines. You can get tons of attention and eyeballs on something that it could be completely false. Bringing it all back, Nicole argues her non-vaccinated children are healthier than most. They're pretty healthy kids, so I feel like I made the best decision for them. While Emily points out vaccinations don't just protect her kids, but thousands of others with cancer or autoimmune deficiencies who can't be vaccinated. There is a huge amount of effort and money going into scaring parents right now. So what's next? Experts say most importantly, parents and pediatricians should have open, respectful conversations. In the end, it's always the parent's decision. Russell Haythorn, Denver 7. We wanted to hear from you, and boy, did we hear from you. Sean said, if you choose not to vaccinate, you forfeit the ability to send them to public school and potentially expose other children. Eileen says, the vaccine manufacturers are protected and have no liability whatsoever.
Now, if you have something you want to say on this topic or any other you see, let us know. Email us at 360 at the Denver Channel .com, or you can weigh in anytime on Facebook. Well, for parents, this question's a tough one. When's the right age for children to get a phone? And should phones be allowed in schools? Our Jennifer Kovaleski goes 360 on the issue to help you decide what's best for your family. It's the heartbeat of a generation. But beyond the sounds, endless likes, and instant gratification. I don't think any of us knew or could have predicted exactly how addictive these phones were going to be. There's a bigger question parents are grappling with. What happens when this <laughs> becomes more important than this? It's not the focus of our lives. Angela Tapp says kids live on their phones as is, and she questions whether having them in middle school classrooms disrupts learning. My biggest fear is we don't understand the impact of the smartphone just yet. That's just one reason. She's calling for an all-out ban in her school district. This is a petition. It's called No, no Cell Phones in Jefferson County Middle Schools. Tapp says her opposition isn't just the unknown impact, but the unneeded distraction, too. I don't believe there's a place for them. There's lots of data that, re that reports that even the feeling of a vibration on your hip when you're taking a test can lower test scores. Sophomore Ashley Piper understands that viewpoint. People just get distracted by it if it buzzes or something, and then takes away from the learning. A fair point, some agree, but an all-out ban in Jeffco Middle Schools. Angela says yes, because she doesn't want kids like hers, who won't have phones, to be stigmatized. They've never had one before, and we are thrown into the idea of, do we need a smartphone to be socially and academically uh, successful? Other parents see the issue through a completely different lens. And they ask Siri how to spell words, so it's useful. Parents like Jen Casper say the phone is a great tool. In an age in which encyclopedias and dictionaries are as easy to find as rotary phones and, well, phone books. But there are more important reasons, she says. I need my kids to have their phones because for me it's it's easier and it's a convenience. Even more importantly, Casper says her kids can reach her if they need help. Let's go back to our student Ashley who shares that point of view and says at the end of the day, that's why she's against the band. I just like to have it, even if I'm not on it, it just, I like to have it just in case something happens. But Angela says that's yet another reason for a band. Kids snapping, chatting, and tweeting during a lockdown or school shooting, she says, can hurt more than it helps. We have seen an indication that students can flood the cell phones and really take down the communications that they need in a time of crisis. Back to Jen, who says all opinions aside, the issue should be cut and dry. As she's my child, and I should make the decision, not the school. So where does the school administration come down on this one? Talking about getting rid of cell phones or severely limiting cell phone use in our schools would be a pretty heated discussion. Diana Wilson with Jeffco Schools says she's heard the many arguments for and against the ban, and the district is just trying to find the right balance. There are definite risks. As a school district, we think it's definitely the positives outweigh the negatives. And with that, the administration is leaving the decision to the middle school principals, who they say know what's best for their campuses. There's one more point of view worth exploring. Emily Markeski is a psychologist with Children's Hospital Colorado. And we're learning a lot from the mistakes and the good choices made by this parenting generation. Markeski says she understands all points of view, but adds, we just don't know how nonstop phone time is impacting our kids. It really depends so significantly on the developmental and maturity level of each individual kid. Which brings us back to why TAB wants a ban, until we know more about the impacts of this heartbeat of a generation. They're working diligently on getting you to stay on the phone, and until we kind of get a handle on how that's impacting our young people, that's a real direct impact to my family. Jennifer Kovaleski, Denver 7. A college education may help your skill set, but it comes with a hefty price tag. Don't get help from my parents, um, so student loans is absolutely necessary for me getting my education. Up next, a 360 view of student loans. Is a higher education worth the price? And then, how old is old enough to vote? Where is the common sense in these laws? So we're going to put out warnings not to eat Tide Pods, but we're also going to let them vote. We go in-depth on a proposal to lower the voting age to 16 when Denver 7 Goes 360 continues. Welcome back. Denver 7 continues to go 360. A story that we found out hits home for many families here in Colorado was one about parents evicting their own son after he didn't pay them rent 
or help out around the house. Now, we're not talking about a teenager here, rather a 30-year-old man. Here in Colorado, living with your parents is becoming more common as young people saddled with student debt try and find a place to live within their budget, even as rental prices continue to rise. So we went searching for your 360 perspectives on the issue. I think there are, there are different circumstances for everything. Certainly there's an opportunity for families to live together again if it works for them. Oftentimes, uh, the parents aren't really launching. The parents are supporting and encouraging dependents. And that's the thing that becomes worrisome. So you could either pay a landlord or you could pay mom, and mom would continue to cook, but you had to help. After listening to their perspectives, consider this harsh reality. According to Pew researchers, 15% of millennials live at home with their parents. 15%, that's not bad. Ann was just talking about student loan debt, and it is skyrocketing, jumping more than 200% in the last 20 years. A recent study found that in Colorado, the School of Mines and Air Force Academy provide the best return on investment for students. Still, we wanted to know if spending all that money is worth it. Nick Offerman said, figure out what you love to do, then figure out how to get paid to do it. 21-year-old CU Denver student Marcus Gallegos has figured out what he wants to do, computer programming. But first, he's got to pay for college to be able to do it. I don't get help from my parents, um, so student loans is absolutely necessary for me getting my education. Marcus is on track to finish his master's in computer science in 2022 and leave school with $65,000 in student loan debt, which will take him 21 years to pay off. I'm thinking of beyond repayment of loans. I'm thinking about when I want to buy a house. Am I going to be beholden to a landlord until I'm 42 years old? Now, on the other side, we have Noel Ginsberg. He dropped out of college 38 years ago and founded Intertech Plastics a manufacturing company that's grown to two Denver area plants and 150 employees. Noel is a millionaire many times over. Do you have a four-year degree? I do not. Have you been successful? <laughs> By most estimates, I have. Still working at it, though. Now, Marcus wants a degree. Noel obviously didn't need one. And for convenience, I'll serve as an example of somebody who got a bachelor's degree because it was required by TV news, and it's definitely been worth it for me. But college is a lot more expensive now. Now, I'm getting ready to give you a lot of numbers here, so stay with me. For the 2017-18 academic year, average tuition and fees for one year at a private university in the U.S. was $42,000. At a public university for out-of-state students, $26,000. Public school for in-state, $10,000. Last year, the average student loan debt for a college grad was $37,172. In 2005, the average student loan debt was just $10,000. CU Denver economics professor Andrew Friedman acknowledges the troubling trajectory, but argues the college is still worth the price. But I think the average is still this is worth it. Um, that, that may change, but for the moment, I, th I think the average is absolutely worth it. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics backs him up. The average salary for someone with a high school diploma is $35,256. The average salary for someone with a bachelor's degree $59,124. Jillian Gleason is a school counselor at Denver's Lincoln High School. She says nowadays cost of college has to be discussed when helping students plan their post-high school paths. And then, of course, there are the students who face very real pressure from family and friends to go right into college. If they're not ready, I would not advise that. I don't think that that's something that I would encourage. I feel like you have to be ready, you have to be invested. Back to Noel Ginsberg. He's not just a college dropout multimillionaire businessman. He's also CEO of the newish nonprofit CareerWise. That program encourages Colorado high school students to explore what they really want to do. When they land on something, an apprenticeship in that industry is set up for them. And it's not a failure of the education system. I would propose that it's a failure of business and industry not recognizing what their role is in education. Through CareerWise, students identify what they want to do. Mercedes mechanic, cop, teacher, spine surgeon, whatever. Then CareerWise helps plot the training needed to get there. And there are some viable and extremely practical non-college paths. For instance, a trade school. Those cost on average $33,000 total and take between 10 and 18 months to finish. You come out with a job that brings home on average $42,000 a year, but a trade school trained construction manager say can easily earn more than $100,000 a year. 
100 k for a $33,000 education and probably very little school debt? Well, something to think about. What is that career and what's the best way to get the skills and the competencies to be successful? And if that includes a four-year degree, go and get one. But don't believe that that's the only way to do it. There are, there's equal dignity in multiple paths. So, is college worth it? Yes. No. We'll see. At the age of 16, you can't drink, you can't smoke, can't even buy some cleaning products from the big box stores. And you can't vote either, which is being debated all across the country right now. Jennifer Kovaleski spoke to people from all ends of the spectrum for our 360 look at the voting age debate. The case for lowering the voting age to 16 first started making headlines again following the Parkland shooting. Where is the common sense in these laws? because of the systematic failure of our government on every level. Supporters say this student activism is challenging the tiresome stereotype that American teens are narcissists whose brains have been idled by smartphones. That us kids don't know what we're talking about, that we're too young to understand how the government works. In their view, if high school students can organize a worldwide march in face of an issue as difficult as gun control, they are more than capable of voting. Others see this as proof. Teens have a stake in the game, and politicians need to pay attention to them. So why hesitate to include a new demographic of voters, more eager and engaged than a lot of us? I find it entertaining. John Caldera, president of Denver's Independence Institute, says not so fast. So we're going to put out warnings not to eat Tide Pods, but we're also going to let them vote. He also believes 16-year-olds shouldn't be allowed to vote on how other people's money is spent. To vote on other people's money when you're not paying into the tax structure in any sizable way. Um, now that seems a little irresponsible. Then there's what he calls a double standard around gun control. If they are able to voice their First Amendment rights with, a, uh, with the right to vote, they should be able to enjoy their Second Amendment rights at 16 as well. Another point of view worth exploring comes from child psychiatrist Jennifer Hackney. I think at 16, from a cognitive development standpoint, kids have absolutely developed the cognitive ability to consider abstract concepts. Hackman says numerous studies show 16-year-olds have the ability to solve difficult problems and consider different challenging questions. After all, she says, a lot of teens are more informed than older folks these days. 20 countries have granted teens aged 16 and 17 the right to vote. A handful of American cities have done the same for local elections. In 2013, Tacoma Park, Maryland became the first U.S. city to lower the voting age. Nearby Hyattsville, Maryland did too. And in Berkeley, California, people 16 and up can now vote in local school board elections. This is about showing everybody that this will never happen again. The question now is will this rise of student activism amount to any real change at the ballot box? Jennifer Kovaleski, Denver 7. Now, this is another topic that many of you have strong feelings about. Robert wrote to us saying, quote, this is the same age group that's eating Tide Pods, snorting condoms, and jumping out of moving vehicles. I don't think they're mature enough to vote. But Randall sees it this way. He says, when you see how bad the adults have trashed the country in the last election, I have to pause and think about it. They may have more common sense than many adults in this country. Ouch. All right, take your kids to the mall or even to school, and you just might be wondering what the other parents are thinking about you. So you wonder because chances are you're judging them too. A 360 look at parent shame when we come back. Before its makers decided not to release it, we went 360 on a controversial video game called Active Shooter. The game would have allowed gamers to play the role of a school shooter or a police officer responding to a school shooting. But after more than 100,000 people signed an online petition, the game was pulled from the digital storefront where it was expected to go on sale. And game manufacturers sometimes make mistakes and so sometimes do parents. Uh, yeah, sometimes when we do, there's another mom or dad around to point it out. So where is the line between protecting our kids and just being a judgmental jerk? Denver 7 reporter and mother of two, Nicole Brady, gives us a 360 view on parent shaming. Ready? Here we go. It happens on the playground. You watch other parents and their kids, and let's be honest, you judge. I don't think it's like intentionally judging, but you actually do it because you think you would do differently. In some cases, silent judgment gives way to outright parent shaming. 
In a recent New York Times opinion piece, Motherhood in the Age of Fear, the author recounts how she left her four-year-old child in a car while she quickly ran into the store. Someone in the parking lot recorded her actions on a cell phone and called police. The author says women today are being harassed for making rational parenting decisions, but it depends on who you ask. The founder of the advocacy group KidsAndCars.org says it is never okay to leave a four-year-old child in a car. Unfortunately, our issue got brought into this whole conversation, but our bottom line is if you talk to the parents that have lost a child in this manner, you would never even consider doing this. What some see as a safety issue, others see as busy moms trying to do it all. I've gone into the store and let the TV on in the car so they can watch their cocoa and been just fine for a minute and a half. Moms we spoke to told us they've also been judged for their mistakes and their choices. Yes, for one thing, breastfeeding. We lost my, my little guy and I did see judgment eyes, of course, but then I also had people saying, what does he look like, let us help you. Nikki started a mom support group in Highlands Ranch and says if more people helped rather than shaming, we might all parent better. We're all struggling through this. We, nobody has all the answers. Nobody's the perfect parent. We took the question to Facebook. Is parent shaming a problem? Just listen to Amy's list. Vaxxers versus anti-vaxxers, attachment parenting, breastfeeding versus formula feeding, nutrition, free range parenting versus helicopter parenting, how to discipline a child, working versus staying at home. I've seen other moms be immensely mom shamed by all of the above. Mom shaming is out of control. In the end, many moms say it comes down to trusting yourself, regardless of what other people think. If I worried about everybody else, it was going to affect my parenting. From one imperfect parent to another, Nicole Brady, Denver 7. Whether it's parent shaming or anything else, we want to hear your opinion. Sharing and listening to differing points of view is what helps us all make informed decisions. So if you have an opinion you want to share, email us at 360 at thedenverchannel.com. You can also send us a message on Facebook or Twitter. I'm Andrew Heal. And I'm Shannon Ogden. And for all of us here at Denver 7, thanks for joining us. We will see you next time we go 360. Good night.